Uh, so you can uh, go ahead and unmute and switch over to your presentation. And I'm going to, yeah, you're unmuted. Great. Hey, great. Can, every, can everyone hear me? Absolutely. Good. Okay, so, so thanks for having me uh, here today, and uh, thanks for taking time out of um, all of your busy days and uh, nights, depending upon uh, where you're at in the world. Um, I'm very happy to be talking about uh, responsible operations, data science, machine learning, and AI in libraries, uh, a research agenda, so to speak. Um, so I have a pretty simple agenda uh, for, for my, my talk today. I'm going to do a little bit of discussion of the, you know, what is this thing? Um, how did it come to be? Um, and then I'll follow that with a suggested path through some of the areas of investigation and challenges that are included in the agenda. And I'll, I'll conclude with um, some thoughts about potential next steps. So it feels a little bit weird to, you know, talk about a slide with a picture of myself in it, but <laughs> it is uh, an integral part of the, the what and the how. Uh, for the past year, for the, or for 2019, I had the privilege of um, being a practitioner researcher in residence at OCLC Research. Um, worked with some wonderful colleagues there um, and focused most of my time on the development of um, this research agenda. The research agenda, in short, um, is meant to help chart a path for responsible operationalization of data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. Um, I was guided in this work by a fantastic advisory group um, comprised mostly of um, R1 university library deans, um, but also some other folks working in different roles, like Kate Zward at the Library of Congress and Trevor Owens, also at the Library of Congress. Um, <clears throat> a couple of disciplinary scholars, uh, one of them being Melissa Terrace at the University of Edinburgh. And I was thankful for all of their keen guidance in the development of this research agenda. I also engaged a landscape group in a series of synchronous conversations to elicit challenges and opportunities for this research agenda. These conversations and their contributions form the foundation um, of, of most of the substance of, of this particular output. Uh, all told, it was about a year of activity, uh, approximately 60 hours of interviews, one face-to-face -face event um, that we organized at OCLC in Dublin, Ohio, three conferences, uh, which resulted in 144 challenges. Um, during the drafting phase, 150 comments uh, across seven drafts of the research agenda that hopefully some of you now have in your hands or, or have in your browser. So it was, a, it was a lot of work. A note about scope. Um, in terms of the folks that, uh, that I interviewed uh, and engaged with for the development of this research agenda, most of them were working um, in the United States. Um, so if there were to be you know, sort of future efforts um, or follow-ups to this agenda, um, I think it would, be, it would be great to expand to um, different geographic areas, perhaps Asia Pacific, um, perhaps um, Latin America, I think, I think would be really interesting. Um, some additional notes about scope. Um, so, you know, this, this talk and the agenda is really not an ode to big data, um, nor does it focus on, on, on GPUs needed to do some of these things or, or engineering. And, you know, you're also not going to hear either in this talk or in the agenda sort of this unfettered ahistorical enthusiasm for scale. Um, it is my feeling, and it was the feeling of a lot of the people that I talked to, um, that, that, that focus on scale, that ahistoricism, can lead us to you know, some of the you know, very public missteps and uh, instances of harm that uh, our private sector companies um, are, are inflicting in their use of, say, computer vision or artificial intelligence. And so the agenda is trying to help us to see a different path, where rather than focusing on scale or big data, um, that we focus instead on the notion of responsible operations. Um, 
you know, and I define this as a commitment to fostering individual, organizational, and community capacities for responsible operationalization of data science, machine learning, and AI. And I got this concept originally from Ruman Choudhury, um, who is the uh, responsible AI lead at Accenture. Pardon me. Responsible operations pushes us to think, you know, as we're kind of weighing the good and the bad, the use of some of these technologies and methods, um, that, you know, we would understand that the strength of our movement in this space is in our relationships and that these relationships could only be measured by their depth, you know, both within the library and especially outside of the library, the communities that we're aiming to serve. And scaling up any discussion of scale uh, would mean going deeper and being more vulnerable and empathetic uh, in terms of how we're thinking about engaging these technologies and methods for the benefit of our communities. There have been a number of works over the past few years uh, by Meredith Broussard and Kathy O'Neill. Uh, in the library community, I feel that Sophia Noble's work, Algorithms of Oppression, um, has had a significant impact in terms of helping our community to become more aware of some of the ethical pitfalls of um, um, algorithmic methods or, or, or systems that are driven, driven by algorithmic means. But the, the awareness level across our communities is getting higher. Um, but what I heard from contributors to the agenda is that there remain um, significant gaps between our conceptual understanding, say, of something like algorithmic bias and taking what we know and actually operationalizing that within the context of our development of our infrastructure, uh, workflows, uh, services, position descriptions, um, and so forth. And so, you know, my goal has been to try and create a research agenda that gets us toward operationalization um, uh, of these technologies and methods that, that, that is, a, is, a, is a responsible form of engagement. And part of the way that I've tried to, you know, keep a laser-like focus on that is, you know, in the course of the conversations and gathering of inputs into the agenda, I really tried to maintain a focus on, you know, questions over methods. Um, and that sounds like a pretty simple, simple kind of thing to keep a focus on, but it actually can become quite hard um, anytime you invoke something like AI or machine learning or, or big data. Um, you end up talking often more about a thing or a method, and, and we kind of lose sight of the, the motivation for being interested in that thing at all. So I try to flip uh, the frame of engagement on its head to really sort of center um, the motivating questions of the things that matter in the here and now, rather than sort of projecting ahistorically into thinking about what might be possible and losing sight of, of um, our current expertise um, say like the the provenance of our of our work, and you know how how we can engage meaningfully and how we have a right to be in this space. And so I prioritize questions over methods. And so anytime data science, machine learning, or AI was brought up, it almost took the form of a of a learning outcome. It's like okay, we're talking about data science, but in order to do what, and for who, and by who. Right? You know, both those things are really important that we maintain a focus on the communities that ostensibly we aim to serve by, by using something like machine learning. And at the same time, and I think this is critical, you know, by who? Who in our libraries is going to do this work? And are they appropriately resourced in order to do it? And if they're not, what might need to happen? And so that ultimately led to uh, the research agenda responsible operations, data science, machine learning, and AI in libraries. There are seven areas of investigation in the agenda. Um, within each of those areas of investigation, there are 18 challenges. And then subsetted within those 18 challenges, there are 51 recommendations for individual and community action. Just a quick sort of like high level run through. Um, the first area of investigation is committing to responsible operations through things like managing bias in our work, committing to transparency, explainability, and accountability, distributed data science fluency and generous tools. Um, there's some 
bread and butter here around uh, description and discovery for libraries. So you can say things like enhancing description and scale, or working with uncertainty in probabilistic description. Um, there is an area of investigation around shared methods and data, machine actionable collections, um, come also you know, referred to in the past couple of years as collections as data, workforce development, data science services, and sustaining interprofessional and interdisciplinary collaboration. In terms of how to interact with the agenda, you know, given these you know, seven different areas, there could be, a, uh, um, could be presenting the sense that these are like silos. So in terms of thinking about how to move forward, you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to do the machine actual collection. One. That sounds like an interesting one. Um, which is all well and good that, that you, you may be more attracted to you know, some of these areas of investigation than others. But part of the argument that I've been trying to make in sort of responsible operations as a concept and uh, what would be needed in order to do this work responsibly is that the areas of investigation are interdependent. Um, you know, the, the idea being, for example, that you know, if you wanted to say, um, let's see here, go one step up. If you wanted to say use, uh, I don't know, computer vision to identify um, objects in uh, backlogs of digital collections that are minimally described, um, you could do that. But part of the argument here is that it wouldn't really make sense to do that without also engaging um, challenges that are in another area of investigation. So for example, if you wanted to pursue enhancing description at scale, it seems that it would make eminent sense to also engage with some of the sections of committing to responsible operations, which would be you know, working through, you know, if you're going to apply computer vision to a collection at scale, that you also think through how you're going to manage your own individual um, and institutional bias in the use of that technology um, and connected to that, you know, how you're going to be transparent um, in your use of that technology and how you're going to make it explainable to your peers and especially to the community um, for which that collection is meant to serve. And at the same time, you know, that also raises the question of workforce development, that by who question, right? So it's one thing to want to do, you know, sort of enhancing description at scale and to think through questions of bias, but then at the same time, you know, how do we optimally prepare and support um, a workforce in a holistic way um, that can make critical use of these technologies and, you know, kind of avoid some of those private sector mistakes. So there's an argument here for interdependency in terms of how various parts of the agenda are engaged. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, there are seven, uh, seven areas of investigation, 18 challenges, and 51 recommendations. That would be a really long presentation. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not going to put you all through that today. I'm always happy to talk about every part of the agenda. Um, but instead, I've, I've opted for a strategy of characterizing um, a path through the agenda where, um, you know, sort of I, I'm just going to select um, a couple of challenges from you know, different parts of the agenda uh, that characterize some of the interdependency, I think, that, that I was just describing. So the path that we will be taking uh, is from four different areas of investigation, and it's just going to be <clears throat> four recommendations that are discussed, so four out of the 51 recommendations. So the first um, area of investigation uh, that I'm going to talk about is called managing bias. So responsible operations, let's see, sorry, I'm just seeing the link, one second. Question. Oh, I, I guess I could catch up to that in the Q&A. Um, so responsible operations call for sustained engagement with human biases manifest in training data, machine learning models, and outputs. Now, 
I think this slide's kind of funny. So <laughs> it, uh, on the concept of remediation, right? So, you know, one of the ways that uh, we talk about uh, reducing bias or mitigating bias is through remediation. And this shouldn't be an alien concept. Many of us have tried to do, say, metadata remediation, and it often kind of feels like this. You try and fix one thing, and then you end up carrying the load of either all of the changes that you made or all of the changes that someone else made, and then you, you, you grow increasingly uncertain as you're working through the remediation, and then it's like, what am I doing? What am I doing here? <laughs> what a waste. Um, and so, you know, kind of picking up off of a conversation that I had with Nicole Coleman at Stanford Libraries, um, you know, one of the things that she said, we were talking about this challenge of bias in data or bias in algorithms and, you know, how that could skew how we're using some of these technologies, um, say, to disadvantage underrepresented populations. And she said, I think she made an excellent point, you know, she said, I really think that we need to talk less about remediation and less about removal of bias. And what we do need to talk about is managing bias. Because if we work to remediate bias or remove bias, um, that essentially we're just introducing a new bias. So the honest thing to do would be to talk about managing bias and, and how we're going to do that. And if we accept the premise that rather than removing bias, that we are instead going to focus on managing bias, um, then you know, really libraries uh, are in the game and have been in the game of managing bias for quite some time. Um, you know, when we develop collections, when we describe collections, think about what to teach and what not to teach, um, that we have, you know, um, uh, a lot of experience in managing bias. Um, of course, that is not an ahistorical reference. We, uh, our, you know, our community has also evidenced, you know, multiple instances of not managing bias well. Um, and so we find ourselves in a period of, you know, trying to, to correct that. But what I do like about this is that it expands the frame of engagement for an institution where it, the question of algorithmic bias or bias in data isn't, is, is all of a sudden not just the province of, um, say, the, uh, the data scientist in your library or the person who can program in your library or your repository developer or your metadata librarian. All of a sudden, if you accept this you know, bias management paradigm, it creates opportunities for people across the library to provide input and to sort of meaning, meaningfully shape activity in the spaces. So that's good, right? More of us can be involved. But you know, if we kind of reflect on this um, uh, GIF a little bit more, you know, you know, this could. There's also some negative things here, right? There, there is a, there's some gender uniformity here. There appears to be some racial uniformity that might not be too dissimilar to how IT departments are staffed. Um, and you know, I, I think that. There's something to take away from this as we're thinking about managing bias. Uh, if we look to research in other spaces by uh, West and Whitaker and Crawford, um, they have written about how you know lack of diversity in workforce, um, uh, you know, leads to these you know discrimination feedback loops in the development of artificial intelligence systems. Um, and so, as we think upon sort of our workforce diversity in the library community. Um, you know, the same thing kind of plays out for us. If we want to manage bias, that you know, a, a monoculture cannot really effectively manage it, and um, really, that diversity is is not a nice to have in this work. It it, it is an imperative. So, just you know, one recommendation, you know, a, a little bit of a, of a divergence here, um, um, is to explore the creation of a practices exchange that highlights successes as well as notable missteps in cultural heritage use of data science, machine learning, and AI, and that we commit to transparency as a means to work against repeated community mistakes. And you know, this is something that Metcalf, Moss, and Boyd, I you know, think in writing about Silicon Valley, they've referred to it as blinkered isomorphism. And so you know, this is this, uh, you know, this phenomenon where you see a number of different Silicon Valley companies, like ducks in a row, all making the same harmful mistakes. Um, and, and, you know, and their use of these technologies, their disposition towards privacy, and so forth. Um, and so I think we would do well to kind of take, you know, that lesson, um, and in our community, think about something like a practices exchange that, that doesn't just, you know, become a series of presentations on how well we're using something like computer vision, um, but also, you know, gives equal attention to the areas where um, we're making mistakes and the stuff isn't working. Uh, next, you know, sort of step in the path is this 
shared development and distribution of methods. Um, so there's a lot of libraries using computer vision, and they're finding so many things. <laughs> but you know, are the things they finding the number of things? Is that good? Like, okay, you found a million butterflies in your historic image collections, but empirically, is that good? I think it's kind of an open question, you know, partially because um, you know, current development and use of these technologies um, in libraries, fairly archipelagic, um, disconnected, uh, often resource intensive, resource privileged institutions are doing this work. And <clears throat> venues and mechanism for shared refinement of the methods are few. And you know, if there aren't sort of open and shared venues for uh, refining methods in an open and transparent way, then that impacts uh, assessment of the viability of the methods. And at the same time, it also impacts broader uptake, both by well-resourced institutions and perhaps especially by less well-resourced institutions. So a recommendation here is to develop venues, publication outlets, and funding sources that facilitate the sharing of methods and benchmarks for machine learning and AI in the cultural heritage community. Next step in the path is broadening machine actionable collections. And this one's pretty straightforward. I like this quote, again, from Adrienne Marie Brown, where she says, we are in an imagination battle. And one of the ways that we can see that um, is, you know, if we look at you know, this data from Emily Bender, um, a, ling um, a linguist, <clears throat> where she characterized, characterized the sort of the paucity of natural language corpora um, for languages, you know, other than, other than English, a um, couple of you know, dominant European languages, um, although I'm not sure how Spanish ended up so low there. I mean, I, I kind of am. Kind of do know why it's like that, but um, this isn't a presentation for that topic. Uh, but, but the fact of the matter is, is that you know there are tons of languages that do not have natural language corpora, and um, you know to kind of you know Bender's like you know, pithy tweet here uh, that natural language is not a synonym for English. One of the things that libraries have done fairly well for the past couple decades is digitize their collections and increasingly digitized collections in languages that are not English and more largely non-Western languages. Um, so part of the question becomes is, you know, how can we take all of our investment into the development of these digitized collections and you know, start to reshape that product and um, uh, provision it in a way that say, just as an example, that it could improve the diversity of research within the natural language processing community. So a recommendation that I have here is to prioritize the creation of machine actionable collections that speak to the experience of underrepresented communities and to inform this work through collaborations with community groups that have ties to collections. And I think this is a really important part for community input, the decisions to not develop a machine actionable collection are as positive as decisions to develop a machine actionable collection, right? So again, you know, this is sort of a recommendation that is grounded in a, in a historical frame of thinking rather than that sort of ahistoric big data, we're going to scale stuff kind of thinking. Um, <clears throat> You know, this is not you know, this, this, this working toward machine actionable collections and AI and machine learning. I don't see it as a freight train that goes in, 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 in just sort of inevitably forward. Um, I think there are going to be moments where you know we have to have conversations with community groups that are impacted by some of this work, and we're going to have to slow things down. And in some cases, if some communities don't want it, why would we do it? And I, and I think that you know there are a number of sort of like challenging, interesting conversations that that should should happen and, and, and do need to happen. And you know, we see this, we see precedent for this in our community with the development of Makurtu, um, and more recently with the development of the CARE principles from the Global Indigenous Data Network that has been collaborating with the FAIR data movement. So last step in the path, 
Um, this is kind of to the to the for who, by who, especially the by who. It's like who's going to do this stuff. Um, there is this uh, you know, challenge of committing to internal talent. Um, it is often the case that with newer areas or emerging areas, we tend to hire a new person from outside the organization um, that you know comes in like this on a star with a little firework behind it, and then eventually that firework runs out, and then this person crashes off the screen, and then you know people are not nice to each other internally, and then maybe they don't last that long. So we you know we don't really want that to happen. And you know, multiple contributors to the agenda did talk about this phenomenon, and you know, they expressed a real desire for you know greater attention to and support for the development of internal talent. Um, you know, we have lots of people working in our organizations in a lot of different functional roles, with a lot of different experiences that they can bring to bear on the use of machine learning, AI, and data science in libraries. Um, for, for library work and also for the communities that we work to support. Um, part of the big challenge there is that, you know, we don't want to do, have like an atlas effect where administratively we get our organizations or try to get our organizations excited about these areas and then we just stack more weight upon the shoulders of our librarians, our archivists, and our staff that are already overburdened without releasing some of that burden. So that they can actually actually pursue pursue their interests, right? So you know, this is the challenge of you know wanting to do new things, but you know having that be empowering for staff rather than having it be just an additional thing um, on top of their current workload. And so the the recommendation that I had here, um, not the most revolutionary one, kind of a perennial one, is that. <laughs> form a working group or something like that, um, probably multiple to investigate the development of organizational models that avoid silos and support hybridity between core and emerging services. Um, you know, models of this kind uh, hopefully encourage natural diversification and or deepening of skills over time. So some, some next steps, um, read the report. Um, Hopefully enjoy it. I'm I'm always open to you know questions about the agenda um, or if you have ideas for potential collaboration. I'm I'm happy to advise on that. Um, as I mentioned, there are ser seven areas of investigation uh, in the agenda. There are 18 challenges and 51 recommendations. Uh, we only talked about four recommendations today. Um, an important sort of closing note, and this again came from one of my conversations with Ruman Chaudhary, is that um, you know she she kind of cautioned you know as we think about something like artificial intelligence um, and uh, both the potential and the peril of, of of engaging it in our spaces that we not sort of run into similar challenges that um, that, that climate change has run into where. Basically, what she said was that you know sometimes the way that the challenge of climate change is framed is that it becomes so big, such a big challenge that um, that uh, individual action can feel meaningless to people and people feel overwhelmed by it. Um, I think that you know one of the things that um, I have you know, said in this agenda and you know written in this agenda is that um, you know no one institution can handle this alone, or not even really one country can handle this work alone. Um, that, you know, basically there, there has to be space for engagement wherein individual action is as valuable as a multi-institutional effort, and that those kinds of efforts actually have a, a mutually, like, reinforcing relationship. So we don't want to do the climate change thing. Um, so that's that's all I have today. I wanted to prioritize more more time for questions and and discussion. Uh, I encourage you to read the report, um, and I, I look forward to any questions that you have. Thank you, Den uh, <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Thomas, so much for uh, your thoughtful presentation and overview. Um, uh, I just want to remind people. Um, we're doing questions via chat, so um, please go ahead and uh, type your type your questions into the into the chat box. Be sure that the option is set to 
um, set to all participants. Uh, would be eager to hear from those of you who are uh, uh, grappling with data science um, uh, uh, efforts at your at your own institutions and thinking about how that plays out either in parts of the report that you may have already uh, read or glanced at or with Thomas's observations um, in uh, in the presentation today. Um, also want to thank Thomas for all of his thoughtful gifts. Uh, those are gifts for all of us. Um, so I'm not seeing uh, any questions at the moment. Um, I do want to underscore that this is an area where uh, the OCLC Research Library Partnership would like to be able to support um, extended discussions uh, and to help the community think about forward momentum as Thomas um, outlined. This is an area where we are uh, stronger together and better if we're able to share challenges and successes um, and also uh, be somewhat vulnerable with one another uh, in, in talking through some of these important areas. Um, not seeing any questions at the moment. Um, Mercy, Thomas, and I can't see questions that don't go to all participants. So if there's uh, anything in there that's been sent to um, a different option, I don't know why WebEx has that uh, as an option to be able to send something than other to all participants. Um, let's see, well, we give people a couple minutes to uh, type things. Oh, here we go. Um, so let's see. Uh, so Deirdre Joyce, okay, this is one that was sent to all attendees. Thank you, Karen, for surfing this. Um, I'm eager to read the report. Don't have questions now, but would love to pick this up at a later time. Great, Deirdre, thanks, thanks for that. Uh, as I said, we do hope to um, be able to have some focused discussions with folks who have uh, had a chance to read the report so that we can pull out which areas uh, people think are um, actionable. Um, Thomas, uh, any any other kind of, I, I know you had to um, pick your pick your favorites to, to work through or at least pick a focus for this presentation. Um, any other uh, comments you'd like to leave people with? We can always conclude early, but uh, I do, I do want to give people an opportunity to um, to get something into chat if they have something. Um, not, not necessarily. I, you know, I, I was, I, I was asked this question, um, something along these lines yesterday, conversation with someone from NISO. Um, you know, what is, what is the one thing you want everyone to know? <laughs> <laughs> Which is always fun. It's like, do a, do a 30 second elevator. Because you know so much. Yeah. Do an elevator speech on a year of work and conversations with like, you know, 90 people. But, um, you know, I, I think for me, it's just the, the emphasis on, I think, the value of responsible operations for our community. Uh, what, it, what I gather is that, that people are really ready um, to, to do something, right? We've, we've had a, a, a lot of discussion uh, about, you know, AI, machine learning, and data science. Um, we've had a lot of presentation in our communities and um, around sort of, um, you know, doing this work ethically. And, you know, what I heard a lot of was like, okay, like now, like we're ready to like roll our sleeves up and, and like decide what to do and do it and also decide what we definitely don't want to do. Um, but, you know, definitely in the mode of like, we want to do stuff now and we want to do it responsibly. We want to operationalize. Um, and uh, so that, that was just the overwhelming feeling that I got from people is that, you know, that people, you know, they, they like talking, they like thinking, they, they're interested in the conceptual things, and now they, now they, now they want to implement. Yep. Um, and, you know, the, the agenda, while it is wide ranging, it's a lot of different, you know, topics, different areas, workforce development, data science services, interdisciplinary collaboration, um, 
describing collections at scale, all of those things like very sincerely are meant to be interdependent challenges, kind of like I was talking about earlier. And I would just encourage people as they're looking at the agenda to be thinking, even as they're drawn to one particular section, um, and if that's a particular area of comfort for them in their work, um, to kind of stretch a little bit and look to the other area of his investigation and think about, okay, like maybe that part like isn't necessarily my job right now, but maybe it creates a context for me to collaborate with someone else in my organization where the collaboration seems elusive. Okay, so we've got, uh, we have a couple, we have a comment from Amanda Reinhart. Um, I don't have a specific question either, but want to champion some of the points that Thomas made, uh, namely the importance of um, relationships, particularly when considering the scales and uh, and I, I want to read this cor correctly because there was a there was a correction. Um, the and the report reflects the complexity of the landscape. Um, it's not easy to tackle these issues, and often the answers aren't aren't readily apparent. And this guidance is very welcome. So thank you for that. Um, I think Thomas did an amazing job of uh, distilling down uh, a, a very complex area into a relatively brief report. So for those of you who haven't looked at the report, this is not one that is going to land on your desk with a thud. Um, but it is, uh, you know, there's a there's a lot of wisdom um, in there, and I think that that will happen. That will help you in working through. Um, another uh, another comment. I'm grateful for the presentation. The report and recommendations are inspiring, and already partly in practice in my local community. Huzzah to that! Um, a lot of culture change needs to happen in higher ed education institutions, um, which are what I know. The culture change needs to happen institution-wide. So uh, what are the largest challenges you see in that regard, and that is uh, for, for culture change to happen even beyond the library, and how do we address that? Um, uh, observations right. about that, Thomas, and how that played out in your conversations? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I, I think that um, you know, part of it has to do with um, as, as with so many of the things that you know, research libraries do, um, uh, you know, it's there. There is a lot of like outreach and advocacy that, that that needs to happen, as we all know, around sort of you know not just you know talking about things, but um, you know presenting our our qualifications and our resources to do particular things. Um, and you know it may be somewhat challenging initially for some libraries, say in in conversation with um, university administration or with um, say departments of computer science, to carve out a space for to be honest relevancy in some of these areas. Um, while that may be difficult, I I do think that it is possible, and um, I think part of what may get us some of the way there is to just you know, start to collaborate more um, uh, with, with, with folks across campus. Uh, you know, I, I will say that in the, in the writing of this agenda and in the discussion of um, managing, I think it was managing bias, that one of the key corrections that I got in that section was from David Smith, a computer scientist at Northeastern University where he was correcting my representation in that section uh, as somewhat ahistorical and not giving appropriate due to librarians and their um, awareness and prior work addressing the question of bias in collection description, um, which I thought was a super interesting correction to have from a computer scientist working outside of a library. And I, I really appreciated it. Um, I, I think we 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 need more more collaborations um, with uh, you know disciplinary scholars you know working outside of our libraries and in adjacent spaces, um, and we need more collaborations um, with uh, administrative partners on campus. I think with respect to the you know disciplinary partnerships, I try to address this to some extent in the last section of the research agenda, which is about interdisciplinary and interprofessional collaboration. 
and that section tries to tackle, and it's only a, a partial tackling, because um, obviously funding isn't, you know, external funding isn't everything, but it is it is something, especially in, in sparking some of those initial relationships. I imagine that David may have, that a computer scientist may have come to that awareness through a series of externally funded collaborations with um, Ryan Cordell and in perhaps, you know, some, some libraries. Um, but, you know, in that particular section of the research agenda, I, I, I reflect on some of the feedback that I got from folks that I talked to um, that were somewhat frustrated uh, with some of the challenges of financially sustaining um, disciplinary collaborations. Um, and the examples that I share there are, you know, sort of you know, some of the frustrations that say, um, cultural heritage organization may run into if they're collaborating with a disciplinary faculty member and they apply for funding from NSF and NSF, you know, comes back and responds and says, well, this doesn't advance basic research. We already solved this problem. I mean, essentially, what you're proposing is not research. Um, or on the flip side, if we characterize all of research inquiry as either science or humanities, which I know is wrong, um, <laughs> but if we go to the humanities side, you know, similar challenges are encountered by cultural heritage organizations proposing to do uh, collaborations with disciplinary faculty when it is suggested that their work does not present a humanities research question. Um, and so part of what I've called for in that section is for, um, uh, you know, more discussion with funders um, and with cultural heritage practitioners in particular to try and um, create more space to, to sustain um, both sides of that collaboration equally so that the relationships can be built, um, so that there can be more, more David Smiths <laughs> in, in the world, hopefully uh, helping us to advance our collaborations. Uh, thanks for that. I just also want to give um, a shout out to our colleague, Rebecca Bryant, who is uh, leading um, a bit of work around looking at the library um, as situated uh, in a range of campus stakeholders. Um, and I think that this very much uh, ties into that work, that, that it, it relates to so much of the work that, that libraries do, particularly in the area of research support, but also in some of our more kind of traditional and core areas, is um, how does the library uh, be um, seen and valued as a, as a valuable stakeholder particularly in areas where the library may be um, not, the, not the kind of majority partner, but maybe uh, playing more of a lead role. Thank you, Rebecca, for sharing that link uh, out. Um, we also have a very active um, uh, research support services uh, uh, um, discussion group. So uh, you can also join that if you want to find out, um, if you want to continue discussions in that particular area. Um, here's another. Uh, question, are you aware of any efforts perhaps in the open repository community to create a common set of tools for making our open collections more amenable to computational use? It's a great question and it's right in the, um, the uh, totally mixed metaphors, right in the bread and butter of my <laughs> research. <laughs> But I've been working on this, you know, project called Collections as Data for almost the past four years now. Um, and mostly what I've seen, uh, at least in these preliminary stages around sort of building consensus, articulating, you know, uh, statements to guide, you know, ethical um, uh, development of collections as data or machine actionable collections um, are, are, are various e examples of effort. Um, but, you know, not a lot of, um, let's track the question here, a common set of tools. Um, I would look to IIIF. Um, I saw Josh, Josh Hadro did a really interesting presentation. I, I think to some extent, that, that to some extent addresses your question um, at the Machine Learning and Library Summit at the Library of Congress last fall. So, so Josh might be someone to follow up with. Um, and just a quick plug is that the, the current Mellon-funded project I work on, Collections as Data Part to Whole, um, is essentially a regranting and cohort development project where we are regranting to multiple different types of institutions around the country to develop implementation models for um, machine actionable collections. Um, so that might be something to look to um, as well.
So thank you for that, Thomas. I'm not seeing um, any other questions or comments that have <clears throat> accrued. And thanks for the um, additional uh, link there, Thomas. We will share, of course, the recording for this uh, webinar along with uh, the links that have surfaced um, in this because that's useful for folks to know about um, some of the things that, that turned up in discussion. Um, I want to, not seeing any other questions at this moment, I want to thank uh, Thomas especially for all of his hard work. Thomas, it was just such a joy to work with you over this last year and to be um, marking the conclusion of your year with us uh, with, this, with this webinar. So thanks for all of that. Thanks to our attendees today. Uh, and um, I think that's it. We, uh, this concludes today's webinar. Thank you all so much. All right, bye.